you very much, and thank you very much to um, Eleanor and Sabrina for welcoming me. I have, over the years, really enjoyed the, the talks that I've attended here, and it's very special to be at the Library of Congress um, to share some of my thoughts and work from um, my new book, which I love, which I absolutely love. Um, so I've been told that I need to stay here. Uh, I normally tend to walk around, but I will, um, I will stay put to uh, have my words captured by the microphone. All right, and uh, thank you. So to begin with the obvious question, what do science and seduction have to do with each other? Eliza, ha Eliza Haywood's 1719 seduction novel, Love in Excess, provides an answer. The character, the matchless Meliora, mingles grief for her father's death with sexual desire for her guardian, who is married, and with a degree of self-awareness, concludes that her guardian is an object not to be safely gazed at. Her guardian, Count Delmont, has a bitter fight with his wife and afterwards encounters Meliora reading. He finds her beautiful and alluring, as you see, lying on a green bank in a melancholy but charming posture, so completely engrossed in reading that she saw not the count till he was close enough to her to discern what was the subject of her entertainment. Delmont manages Meliora's reading as an occasion for flattery, and he compliments her. These compliments resolve into their first sexual encounter the inaugural moment in the novel when they act upon their mutual desire. And there's an addition, a wonderful first edition of the novel over on the side. So what is Meliora reading with such focus and commitment and which makes her look so alluring and beautiful? A volume of philosophy by Monsieur Le Fontenelle. The work for which Fontenelle was most famous was a volume explicating Copernican and Cartesian cosmology. With Fontenelle in her lap, Delmont sees love in Meliora's eyes. Now, Haywood's reference to Fontenelle transpires within an established tradition of figurative associations that couple sexual seduction with scientific knowledge. Natural philosophy, philosophy texts, beginning with Francis Bacon, frequently present scientific practice as heteronormative uh, erotic quests. Consider Bacon's metaphors, which express, expressly identify the early scientists as a masculine seducer. The naturalist, according to Bacon, wants to penetrate the inner, uh, into the inner and further recesses of nature and to find a way at length into her inner chambers. If the natural philosopher seduces, then nature submits. It is no wonder if nature will not give herself into their hands. When Bacon's writings represent nature as female, they imagine that scientific scrutiny is both a form of sexual analysis and an occasion for conquest and containment by the masculinized naturalist. Within the rationale of Baconianism, sexual affective relations permit the practice of science and the production of scientific knowledge. Abraham Cooley, uh, owed upon Dr. Harvey from 1657, describes Harvey's discoveries about the circulation of blood, and in so doing, presents nature as a coy virgin, who, when Harvey's violent passion she did see, began to tremble and to flee while he pursues her. My topic today concerns seduction plots in texts devoted to teaching scientific ideas for they picture characters undergoing an intellectual conversion to its principles. And my focus is on two dialogues translated into English from French and Italian. Fontenelle's study of Copernican and Cartesian cosmology from 1686, and Francesco Algarotti's rendering of Newtonian optics in 1737. So first, Fontenelle. Bernard uh, Le Bouvier de Fontenelle was a major figure of the French Enlightenment for the duration of his long, nearly 100 years um, of, of his life. In 1686, he published his most famous work, Entrain sur la pluralité des mondes, 
an explication of Copernican and Cartesian cosmology. It was in France an instant bestseller, resulting in four editions in three years and 33 more editions up to the author's death in 1757. In a sign of its influence and its radicalism, it was placed on the papal index in 1687, and Fontenelle was uh, elected to the um, French Academy in, uh, shortly thereafter. In 1697, he began his appointment as perpetual sec secretary of the uh, Academy of Sciences, which he held until 1740. He was, in short, a gatekeeper of French science studies. Now, Fontenelle uses dialogue to challenge uh, heliocentrism. This is the belief held by the, the character, the Marchioness, when she first meets the philosopher, her interlocutor in the dialogue. Fontenelle's lady is of a superior rank to her tutor, and Algarotti follows this example. Throughout the pages of the discovery, the philosopher teaches the Marchioness about Copernican cosmology and Cartesian physics, specifically the theory of vortices. In the Cartesian understanding, particles are always in motion and always in contact with each other, each spinning like a planet. Descartes' vortices were disproved by Newton's theory of gravity the year after Fontenelle published the discovery, but Cartesian physics remained intellectually plausible for the next 50 years. And this is something that I always want to underscore with my students. Even though a theory may have been disproven immediately, the original theory continues to linger and seem plausible. There, we don't have historical change overnight. Um, and Fontenelle himself expresses admiration for Newton, but he was not convinced by him. Now, the genre that Fontenelle chooses is important. It's a dialogue between a philosopher and a noblewoman, which allows for, in Fontenelle's words, liberty of natural conversation. The dialogue's dialectic quality enacts the process of learning. Making mistakes and having them corrected is part of learning. It's not an occasion to abandon the inquiry. The French salon culture in which powerful women were active leaders was especially amenable to these sorts of conversations. Fontenelle's was a world organized by elaborate rules of social etiquette, uh, practices that reflected the ideals of politeness, gallantry, and gallantry. These social norms shaped some of the earliest representations of enlightened philosophers. All of this gets incorporated into how Fontenelle imagines the conversation between the noblewoman and her tutor. Within the dialogue, Fontenelle alludes to the genre of romance, a reference that has the effect of easing the dialogue's conjunction of science and seduction. In his preface, he explains, and I'm gonna give you a long quotation. He writes, it is not to penetrate by force of mediation into a thing that is obscure in itself or anything that is obscurely explained. Tis only to read and to represent to yourselves at the same what you read and to form some image of it that may be clear and free from perplexing difficulties. I ask of the ladies for this system, but the same attention that they must give the princess of Cleve if they would follow the intrigue and find out the beauties of it, though the truth is that the ideas of this book are not so familiar to the most part of ladies as those of the Princess of Cleve. But they are not more obscure than those of that novel, and yet they need not think above twice at most, and they will be capable of taking a true measure and having a just sense of the whole. Now to step back for a moment, Fontenelle's point is that reading about natural philosophy, beginners reading about natural philosophy, is just as foreign as reading about a love affair in the 16th century French court. With this allusion to Madame de Lafayette's novel, Fontenelle enjoys his readers to interpret the discovery as though they were attending to the detailed nuances and turns of a seduction narrative. Such reading is an active engagement in the process of representation. Near the conclusion of the discovery, the Marchioness reflects upon the effect of this scientific education on her sense of self. She says, I find the worlds, the heavens, and the celestial bodies so subject to change that I am altogether returned to myself. 
this return to myself is not an attempt to reject or renounce the self-subjective bias, but to welcome it. Learning requires the ability, in Fontenelle's words, to represent to yourselves at the same what you read, to form some image of it that may be clear and free. In the Lockean lexicon, this is the imagination which fiction writers in the 18th century understood as enabling learning through fiction and feeling. Fontenelle insists that, a, insists that a good reader is a good learner, and this individual actively engages the imagination to apprehend new ideas, concepts, and materials. Anyone conversant in the language of romance, such as La Princesse de Cleve, is equally capable of using her careful attention and imagination to understand Copernicus and Descartes. Now, the genre of romance has long been associated with absorptive reading, beginning with William Congreve's preface in 1692 to Incognita, in which he declares that romance elevates and surprises the reader into a giddy delight. Scholars often oppose the romance to the novel, stipulating that the former is infatuated with the uh, extraordinary, the latter with the real. So this idea that romance really is talking about things that could not possibly be is fantasy and extraordinary, and the novel is grounded in a notion of realism. Within this critical tradition, romance pertains to things that are unobservable, that can never be observed. And it's a class of description that refuses experimental verification. So that's a kind of truism in the field. But what I want to point out is that none other than Robert Boyle, the a founding member of the Royal Society, the father of chemistry, and an extraordinary scientist, none other than Robert Boyle challenged the perception that romance exclusively pertains to unverifiable experience. Among his many intellectual pursuits, Boyle pondered the coincidence of romance and natural philosophy, the purportedly antithetical realms of the imaginative and the observable. He authored a text, it's now lost, but it's called Apology for Romances. He also published his own rant, romance, which he penned as a young man. In a text that he published in 1671, The Excellency of Theology, compared with natural philosophy, Boyle makes a comparison similar to the one that Fontenelle makes in his preface. The experience of nature and romance, as Boyle argues, is analogical. In the book of nature, as in a well-contrived romance, the parts have such a connection and relation to one another, and the things we would discover are so darkly or incompletely knowable by those that precede them, that the mind is never satisfied till it comes to the end of the book. In other words, the intricacy of the natural world correlates to that of the romance world. The connection supposes, though it does not fully depict, a philosopher and a reader who share the skill of careful observation. Romance may induce an absorptive reader, but it also primes that reader to perceive the meaningful data of the natural world. Now, Fontenelle's choice of La Princesse de Cleve as an intellectual model also establishes an early link to the seduction plot. La Princesse de Cleve is a seduction story that follows the effective tangle of a married woman and a nobleman. The narrative trajectory and educational imperative in Fontenelle's text require a conversion to Coper Copernican and Cartesian principles and Fontenelle understands this conversion as a seduction story. In other words, seduction allows Fontenelle to take a literary plot and use it to narrate how one learns and comes to believe natural philosophy. In the first dialogue, the Marchioness and the philosopher enjoy a walk in the garden after supper as they discuss the beauty of the night sky. It is a time, they determine, um, uh, most amenable to lovers. The philosopher's description is luxurious. We have the moon shining through the trees that checkered the paths beneath a most resplendent white upon the green. 
the stars looked all like pure polished gold whose luster was extremely heightened by the deep azure field on which they were placed. When the philosopher praises the beauty of daytime, the Marchioness turns to metaphor, day and night as fair and dark ladies, the latter of whom are superior. She also insists that the philosopher agree with her. Nighttime and dark-haired women produce soft effects that lead to romance. She says, as you see, how comes it that lovers who are the best judges of what is pleasing and touching do always address themselves to the night in all their songs and elegies? Both the Marchioness and the philosopher become diverted by how daylight obscures the stars. The star-filled night, night sky facilitates our roving fancies about the universe in a way that daylight cannot. Enlightenment occurs in the absence of the sun. The Marchioness says she has always felt those effects of night, you tell me. I love the stars and could be heartily angry with the sun for taking them from my sight. Her sentiment prompts the philosopher to exclaim, I cannot forgive the sun's taking from me the sight of all those worlds that there are. With that, the Marchioness's curiosity is piqued and is also insatiable. Worlds, she said, what worlds? This is the question that forms the provo uh, provocation for the ensuing scientific dialogue. The philosopher immediately sees this swerve from romance to cosmology as a loss of an opportunity for sexual seduction. And he's afraid he'll be faulted for this. He says, ah, madam, I shall never endure to be reproached with that neglect of my own happiness, that in a grove at 10 o'clock at night, I talked of nothing but philosophy to the greatest beauty in the world. No, madam, search for philosophy somewhere else. He resists, she insists, and the moment for seduction seems to be lost. Astronomy displaces eroticism. However, rather than abandon the seductive framework that he evokes here, Fontenelle instead recalibrates it. The garden bathed in moonlight first allows the philosopher to articulate his own doubled seduction. He is seduced by the prospect of other worlds, and he is seduced by the intellectual desires of the Marchioness. The text explicitly characterizes the philosopher as succumbing to the Marchioness's seduction. He says, but twas in vain to put her off by excuses from a novelty she was already but too much prepossessed with. He says, there was a necessity of yielding and all I could do was to prevail with her to be secret for the saving of my honor. Cosmology and the Marchioness are both alluring they both seduce the philosopher. He capitulates to these desires with the language of surrender. I found myself engaged past retreat. Such enjoinder, such resignation could easily be transported from the voice of a desperate heroine in a seduction narrative. Now, even if one is tempted to dismiss this opening scene, which really precipitates the entire um, dialogue, as merely a contrivance, Fontenelle returns to the same process of seduction on the fifth night. At this point, the Marchioness and the philosopher are discussing those Cartesian vortices. The topic supplies fanciful and humorous asides. The Marchioness says, for example, let my brains turn round if they will, as if you're on a spinning world so everything about us is spinning. Amidst this conversation, the philosopher confessed that his one distemper is love. They, um, wherein the turbulons are not concerned at all, the infin infinite multitude of other worlds may render little this in your esteem, but they do not spoil fine eyes, a pretty mouth, or make the charms of wit ever, ever less. These will still have their true value, still bear a price in spite of all the worlds in the universe. So what he's saying is that in spite of all of the astronomical discoveries and cosmological, cosmological discoveries he might encounter, and all of these discoveries that might ch change one's view of the world, none of this will challenge his ideas about love. The Marchioness laughs and states, love saves himself from all dangers, 
and there's no system or opinion that can hurt him. Now the dialogue's turn to love does more than offer the philosopher and the Martianess an excuse for repartee, and they are endlessly kind of charming and flirting with each other in this way. Falling in love is a process of giving oneself over to the possibilities of seduction. And this acts as a model of knowledge acquisition within the text. Scientific education within Fontenelle's dialogue requires that a learner fundamentally be seduced. Since we are always in the humor of mixing some little gallantries with our most serious discourses, give me leave to tell you that mathematical reasoning is in some things near akin to love. You cannot allow the smallest favor to a lover, but he will soon persuade you to yield another, and after that, a little more, and in the end prevails entirely. So if you grant the least principles to a mathematician, he will instantly draw a consequence from it, which you must yield also, and from that another, and then a third, and maugre all your resistance in a short time. He will lead you so far that you cannot retreat. And this is one of the most remarkable lines. These two sorts of men, the lover and philosopher, always take more than is given them. Persuasion here is seduction. Fontenelle's philosopher recounts the step-by-step -step process wherein one figure inculcates another into a new worldview, whether it concerns amatory relations or cosmology. The process of seduction is inherently social, whether in, it is embodied between two lovers or whether it is virtual between a learned text and a reader. And it relies upon the lure of reading as one finds oneself swept up on a rushing current of proposition after proposition. Believing cosmology results from a series of, enact, of actions enacted by another. Those actions transport an individual from one set of beliefs to another, a dynamic that mimics the narrative structure of seduction stories. The conclusion, whether in intellectual or amatory terms, is submission. While the philosopher in the opening pages positions himself as succumbing to the Martianess ardent desire to know about cosmology, he here turns to the Martianess to tell her you are too far engaged to retire, and therefore you must generously yield. Submission confirms consent and agreement. She says, I yield and confess. You have overcharged me with whirls and turbulence. She announces her confession. I am extremely in love with these ideas you give me. In Fontenelle's text, we see the delineation of scientific education that draws upon and in so doing revises the trope of seduction, so often associated with sexual coercion. The setting of nighttime, being bathed in moonlight, could be seen and generally is seen as anticipating an erotic encounter, encounter. but it is an equally appropriate environment for a discussion of cosmology. Of course, sex and the cosmos are never far from each other. The subject position that, the Fontenelle, that Fontenelle imagines for his Marchioness depends upon careful observation and learning. And it also depends upon her willingness and ability to be seduced into the Copernican and Cartesian imaginary. Now I wanna, uh, the last portion is to talk a little bit briefly about Algarotti. Francesco Algarotti published um, his text, Il, uh, and I don't have Italian, but it's translated by Elizabeth Carter as Sir Isaac Newton's philosophy explained for the use of the ladies. Uh, he published it in 1737. The title page names Na uh, Naples as the place of publication, though it was printed in Milan under somewhat covert cir circumstances, and I'd love to know more about this, but I, um, it's a murky history. Uh, uh, Newton for the Ladies went through six Italian editions in the six years after original, its original publication, with 10 more by 1812, and it was also translated, as you can imagine, quickly into English, French, Russian, Swedish, Swedish German, and Portuguese. 
So it moved across national uh, linguistic borders and it moved um, across the century. So um, Newton for the Ladies does not denounce Copernicanism um, and therefore it, just as Fontenelle's text, it was placed on the um, Catholic Church's index of forbid forbidden books. Also, like his predecessor, Algarotti uses the genre of the scientific dialogue. Algarotti's appropriation of the seduction plot demonstrates the persistence of this plot as a means to enact scientific education. The science he teaches is different, but Algarotti models his dialogue explicitly on Fontenelle's. At the moment that the noblewoman insists upon an ed education, this time in Newton's theories of light and color, Algarotti evokes his predecessor. In response to the noblewoman, the philosopher begged she would at least have patience till evening, telling her that the night had always been the time consecrated to philosophical affairs, explaining that the most polite philosopher in France had made use of it in a circumstance resembling mine and made no scruple of entertaining a fine lady with philosophical discourses in a wood at midnight. Yet the, um, uh, Algarotti's noblewoman is impatient. She spoke, with this, she spoke this with an air of authority that enforced her commands in the most amiable manner and made it a pleasure to obey, says the philosopher. The Marchioness's refusal here to accede to the philosopher's desire, uh, desire for a nighttime tete-a-tete reflects her agency and her uh, greater rank, of course, and also has the effect of, surprise, surprise, increasing the philosopher's desire to be seduced by her intellectual curiosity. When the philosopher fails seduce, to seduce the marchioness sexually, he finds himself instead seduced by her epistemological desires. Philoso philosophers, argues the philosopher, are no different from mistresses, for both have the obligation, he says, to make good on their promises. A mistress must accede to enter into a sexual relation and a philosopher into an intellectual one. But the pathway of seduction works both ways. If the Marchioness seduces the philosopher with her desire to return, to, to learn, then Newtonianism presented by the philosopher in turn seduces her. As in Fontenelle, mathematicians are like lovers. If what you grant them at first be ever so little, they know how to make so good an advantage of it as to lead you insensibly farther than you ever imagined. Even though the marchioness demurs, she says, I have as little skill in the artifices of love as in those of philosophy and mathematics. She is enchanted by and ultimately seduced by the principles of Newtonianism. Her epistemological craving returns throughout their dialogues. She felt, as you see, um, the utmost impatience to be more learned than Huygens. She was not for, a mo not for losing a moment's time, but would have continued our discourses upon vision the next morning as soon as ever we were up. This was all the optics she could get from me in the morning. Following an extensive discussion concerning the refrangibility of light, the philosopher return, responds to the marchioness in terms that point to the structure of desire and to the plot of seduction. Tis in philosophy, as in all other human affairs, where the accomplishment of one desire often gives birth to another. And you have that same process that you saw in Fontenelle. As soon as you learn a little bit, you want to learn more, and you want to learn more. It's a structure of desire. So the female reader of Algarotti's text is imagined as an eager recipient, ready to be swayed by the seductive allure of Newtonian science. She is an affective being. And the plot of seduction is appropriate because it concerns affect, namely a subject's heart rather than her mind. And in this way, uh, Algarotti and Fontenelle are a little bit different. Algarotti writes, the marvelous, of which the heart always desires of being affected is so fond, happily arises in true philosophy of itself without the help of machines. And then he asks, is there anything in which a writer should omit any endeavors to move the heart? So the role of affect in seduction introduces the possibility that the conversion to Newtonianism may not succeed. Because she perceives rather than understands, 
She is affected by and receives Newtonianism. The Marchioness second guesses herself. When they discuss the refrangibility of light, she panics. She asks, have I acted wrong in suffering myself to be too easily convinced? The philosopher assures her that a lady cannot err in this point. Uncertainty does not derail the conversion process. She says, let me entreat you to make me a complete Newtonian. I plainly see by my conversion I shall acquire the knowledge of truth without losing that pleasure which I found in being deceived. And the end of their six dialogues accomplishes her desire for conversion. If the Marchioness is seduced by the ideas of Newtonianism, then she provokes the philosopher by placing Newton himself within such a plot. You seem to represent nature as a coquette, she says, and Sir Isaac Newton as a jealous lover who never thinks he is proof enough of the fidelity of his mistress. The Marchioness's portrait of Newton recalls the scientific and erotic legacy of masculinized intellectual mastery commonly found in Bacon and his followers. The process of acquiring natural philosophical knowledge that then can be distributed to acolytes requires endless experimentation and pursuit. A single experiment does not satisfy a philosopher. The philosopher answers, this was the only object of his love. He confirms the legitimacy of the comparison and suggests that Newton's rightful posture was of a, a jealous lover, driven to distraction to find out any and all secrets of the natural world. Newton, as a natural philosopher, embodies the suspicion of a controlling lover. However, Algarotti's philosopher presses for a key difference. So Newton exhibits philosophical jealousy, and this fray vividly binds the seduction rubric to scientific discovery. Underwriting the process of seduction that the philo philosopher here and the Marchioness undergo is a superstructure that understands seduction as a relation of power and control. Newton's knowledge acquisition does not reside in a static realm, but forcibly encounters nature, its subject, and bends nature to its practitioner's will. The philosopher qualifies the admission that Newton, too, has the desires of a seducer. At the text's conclusion, he distinguishes the Marchioness's passions from Newton's moderation. So the philosopher says, the moderation of our philosophers in never affirming anything to be true which was not demonstrated by observation may serve for an example to most rash asserters. Um, in spite of the Marchioness's enthusiastic response, the findings of Newton, insists the philosopher, are sober and reasoned. He says they are not assertions, but they are discoveries. Now, in Algarotti's text, we witness the multivalent nature of the seduction paradigm in ways that accord with and differ from the precedent of Fontenelle. In Fontenelle, the philosopher reports the Marchioness seduces him, and the Marchioness admits that she is seduced by her scientific education. These are moments of learning, but Algarotti privileges a woman's power of perception over her understanding a form of cognition that eschews Fontenelle's celebration of the imagination and that presents feeling as a mode of learning. Algarotti's text highlights the imperative for seduction built into the project of natural philosophy as a practice. And in this final seduction, the producer of knowledge seduces a vulnerable and feminized nature in the process revealing the gender and sexual politics of knowing and being known. To conclude, through their evocation and adaptation of the seduction plot, these scientific dialogues demonstrate that believing in science is not merely a matter of rational understanding. The idea of virtual witnessing that is written into the early scientific project, which is reading and believing experiments, establishes textual mediation as a vital technology of scientific inquiry. It ultimately depends upon readers reading and imagining, and thus corroborating the accuracy of reported findings. But the seduction plot reveals another technology. Understood as a transformative process, 
Seduction plots move an individual from one circumstance or one set of beliefs to another. Seduction acts upon the individuals who experience it. It pushes one beyond the limits of rational disbelief or belief, and it exacts submission. To use the seduction plot as a model for scientific education spells out the conversion one must ever go, undergo, the conversion to one which one must be subjected to become a modern, enlightened subject. Thank you very much. So when I, and I'm, I'm speaking here into the microphone, yeah, so the, the question was why um, uh, Bacon's language seems to be uh, much more about abuse, abuse and rape rather than seduction. Yeah. So um, my evocation of seduction is may, it draws upon a body of literature that is looking at um, seduction more generally as a continuum, that rape Inclu that includes rape. Okay. And so it is a, 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 it is a taking over of someone without their consent. Okay? And definitions of rape in the 17th and 18th century are in no way commensurate with how we define it today. Um, whether one could be raped depended upon one's subject position, and it reveals all sorts of ideology. Um, but seduction more generally, and the, the kind of moving from rape to marriage, I'm evoking the work of Tony Bowers here. It's using the same logic. It's the same logic of submission. Yeah, so thanks for that question. Yeah, yeah it's very jarring to our, our yeah. modern eyes, right? Um, but I think it's important to remember that the whole idea of um, uh, companionate marriage itself used that same logic. Right. So even uh, institutions and structures that seem um, not to be dependent upon um, violence and abuse are inherent, have that inherent structure within them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tony Bauer's work, uh, the book in particular, it's called By Force or Fraud. Mm -hmm. And um, she's quoting uh, Satan there, um, uh, describing, you know, how shall we take e Eden? Shall we do it by force or by fraud? Yeah. And they're translated um, by Asher Ben and yeah. Elizabeth Carter. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, what, how do you see, the, if you see, a cultural transformation mm -hmm. um, in continental understandings of uh, romance and plot over to Britain? And what, why yeah. I'm thinking that is because um, often there's a sense that French, for example, romances are much more psychological yeah. than um, English. It's more rooted in a different, rather than to plot to scheme, they're rooted mm -hmm. into map and yeah. um, actually observe. I mean, so I was yeah. just wondering yeah. if you had done anything with that, with the but appropriation, the cultural appropriation, and maybe transformation. Yeah, that's a really nice point. So, so the, the um, what I did not have time to talk about is the, the acts of translation. So I'm, you know, I'm writing about the British Enlightenment, and one of the things I'm very interested in thinking about is the porousness of these um, mm -hmm. kind of national mm -hmm. linguistic borders. I draw upon the translations mm -hmm. as uh, imagining them as, you know, this is one of the key ways that they were available to a British reading public. Someone like Alfred Bain, so first, a, a few things. One, uh, translation was a way that women writers made money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the, you know, and it was uh, kind of open to them. Mm -hmm. um, and Elizabeth Carter made a, a sizable amount mm -hmm. for her translation of Algarotti as well as um, um, uh, her other things, and she was very learned. We don't have a, as much of a record of her imprint in the text. 
We do with Afra Bain, mm -hmm. she ta a few things. She takes Fontenelle's name off the title page and puts hers on there. Mm -hmm. She has, right? She also claiming that kind of authority. She also has an extended uh, treatise about translation. And the, um, within that, she makes a number of scientific arguments um, discounting Fontenelle's science. So she's putting her mark as a scientific expert mm -hmm. through the process of translation. So the, second, the, the next thing I would say is that com, uh, I chose her translation for a number of reasons. There were, other, you know, Glanville, there was a, a translation by uh, Glanville, you know, fellow of the Royal Society, and there was a, an Irish translation that was immediate. And those are very, um, you know, they, they, they take the, the French references and they make them English. You know, and kind of very explicitly nas try to national, not quite nationalize, but make them very, um, particularly with Glanville. Um, and this becomes a way of pumping up the Royal Society. What Bain is interested in, because she has the variety of writing, kind of, um, and experience writing, why I find her translation much more interesting is she, ca she um, focuses in on this quality of fancy that is absolutely central to my reading of the romance. So this is to get to your other question about, or your question about the, the mobility of the seduction plot. Mm -hmm. And so Fontenelle is using this idea, he evokes this, she translates it as fancy. Mm -hmm. That fancy is an intellectual technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a kind of gateway to think about what in my larger work I call uh, literariness. Mm -hmm. So that's literary knowledge. So fancy becomes a way to think about literary knowledge. I think your point about seduction being intellectual versus in the, the you know, in the, if you just compare the 17th century tradition mm -hmm. between France and Britain, mm -hmm. I mean, in the 17th century, uh, 17th century, late 17th century English tradition, it's violence. Mm -hmm. These are, it is, it's, it's rapes. It's mm -hmm. constant mm -hmm. kind of physical sexual assaults. Mm -hmm. um, and that is so-called seduction, right, versus the psychological. So I think that's a, 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 a nice point to keep in mind. Um, and so there's a kind of um, importation that seduction has to do with sex and bodies, but it also has this other way of working intellectually. Yeah, and I think that's why it's such a productive plot and narrative trajectory for thinking about the world in a radically new way. Yeah, that challenges everything that you ever thought of. And how do you how do you come to believe that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Question. I have this notion that uh, that men in early modern society um, only know how to approach women in a sexual attitude. Mm -hmm. Right. If you talk about Elizabeth, you go back and talk about Elizabeth and Essex. Essex doesn't want to have an affair with her. He wants position. He wants money. But this is the only language he knows how to use to approach women. Mm -hmm. That's a that's an interesting question. So that's uh, these two texts are designed. They say they're for women readers, and they imagine the woman, right? They their readership was imagined much more broadly. Mm -hmm. So the you know Fontenelle imagines, and he says quite specifically, I am writing to for men and women. So in a sense, within the fiction of it, she's seduced. But within the, pr the reading practice of uh, discovery, anyone, it's a subject position that's open. It may be feminized, but it's open to, um, and it's imagined, Fontenelle imagines through the salon culture, right, that men and women are going to be reading this and have that, that process of learning science is about one of uh, seduction. And so this is why you have the philosopher in both texts imagining being seduced. And this is why, um, so I agree with you in a certain way, that the, um, but I think it has a greater flexibility within the text. So there is that subject position of kind of imagining a young woman 
or in this case, I mean, it's tricky because these are women of, of rank. Mm -hmm. But they're still women. <laughs> but they're, they're still women. They're women of rank. They're, they're, the, they're tutors of a, are of a lower rank. So it's, we're at this time where gender and rank are still, rank is still in many ways going to trump gender. Not completely. I mean, I'm a long-term <laughs> feminist scholar, um, so I see what you're saying. But I think what, one of the things that I'm interested in is how this trope comes to explain um, and becomes a way of convincing people about empiricism. I think that gets lost in the history of science. Absolutely gets lost in the history of science. And Isabel yeah. Lindsay first translates the English version. Yeah. The Yeah, yeah. I mean, do shot today, yeah. So you have, it's, th this is also a world in which um, uh, what we think now as the disciplinary knowledge of science being absolutely um, uh, a million miles away from the disciplinary knowledge of the humanities, that disciplinary difference doesn't exist. And so to be learned and educated, one was fluent or had some kind of fluency. And so these texts are operating in that kind of marketplace as well. You could buy a ticket and go see, um, you know, Benjamin Martin, who his, um, uh, he has a guidebook over there for, and it's addressed to young gentlemen and ladies. And the fiction is it's a, it's a brother coming back from university telling, uh, teaching his sister. Um, but this was available to anyone who was, you know, picking up um, a novel, going to the theater, going to learn a little bit about Newton. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, my question is, do you think that Fontenelle and, and Algarani are, their primary motivation is to write expositions on, on how one learns, or are they simply writing manuals for scientific uh, education? I mean, what, what are their, you're making it sound like you know, they're really thinking about the, this whole, how, how does one understand and learn? Yeah. I th they can't, it's inextricable. So to promote the, the scientific theories, they have to chart out how one comes to believe them. Because you don't have, um, because the information, in a sense, is so radical. So there's no precedent. It is how do you uh, kind of uh, radically convince someone of that the sun is not the center of the universe. And so when that is such a, a kind of experiential, um, diurnal notion of what the world is. So I think that for both of them, um, their, the choice of a dialogue signals right off the bat that they're interested in demonstrating the process of learning. Yeah, and so that is a very kind of that back and forth a bit by bit. They could have written it as a treatise. This is, you know, from start. There are lots of different genres that would have been available, but they choose a dialogue and they choose a scientific dialogue and they choose these particular characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that you can't, for them, it's absolutely bound together. Yeah. Yes, hi. Thank you so much. This was Thanks. such a wonderful, rich talk and so many questions. Oh, great. Yeah. But I think that in terms of the history of science, you know, there's a lot of thinking about how we learned by doing and sort of the way in which um, people did best before computers. Mm -hmm. How does the sort of mode of reading sort of reduction of that mm -hmm. sort of figure into that? Because you're devoid of the you know, actually looking or actually doing. So right. I mean, like you don't have the prism, right? So how yeah. are you understanding the light refraction? You don't have Not yeah. generally, right, not generally, yeah, yeah. Was there more to that? No, 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 yeah. no. Okay, so there is, you know, absolutely what we think of now as scientific knowledge is generated through artisanal practice. Mm -hmm. So you have Hook and all of those people doing, you know, and Ian Hacking, Hacking talks about experiment is doing. 
So there is that realm in which discoveries are made. I mean, I'm using the passive voice, right? Which they make discoveries. Mm -hmm. The challenge, and this is where uh, my work is, is thinking about Shapen and Schaefer, um, Leviathan and the air pump, but really pushing well beyond because what they have, what Shapen and Schaefer have given us is an understanding that uh, for scientific knowledge to be corroborated, which it always needs to be corroborated, there are only so many people who can look under a microscope. And so you, they use this idea, which you may be familiar with, of um, virtual witnessing, mm -hmm. which is a lit and what they mean by that is readers reading the experiment and imagining that they can do it. And that becomes a mechanism of authorization. So you have built in to the way that early scientific knowledge is produced the um, experiential and the literary. And the literary requires the imagination of the reader to visualize something as plausible. And that realm of plausibility and that realm of imagination is, it gets obscured because we think facts are facts, right? It gets obscured, but that is the prop, that can only happen through a literary imagination. So the step to a seduction plot is to say, this is another literary technology that accomplishes the same thing. And so it is, there is also the, you know, there's the sense that these things are available. You can buy a microscope, you can look through a telescope. Eliza Haywood's female spectator talks about, you know, she and her friends go out to the country and they look at all sorts of things through a microscope, they go to a neighbor's house and look through a telescope. But the, so there are these um, moments of praxis, but what um, is absolutely central are these moments of representation of that praxis. And so that's the, the, you know, it's the role of the, one of the things I'm really interested in is the role of the imagination in empirical knowledge. And it is, you know, Boyle talks about this, Hook talk, you know, the, it's in their, their own literature, um, their own way of understanding. But I think in the history of science, we've really, and the kind of triumphalism that science is objective, like the history of objectivity is, um, um, obscures the subjective and degrades it. And I think that what, what I want to recover is the, the fact that it is not degraded, it's absolutely central to the artisanal and, and um, experiential. Yeah. I, would, I would yeah. completely agree with you, but I, I'm, just, I, I'm wondering if there's um, also an assumption on the part of these male authors um, that, I mean, I guess it's maybe a gender-based argument, because you find at least in the middle of the 18th century, it's a women's paper, like this is the way we yeah. to sort of water it down and distill it to get the readers to understand. And it, it just seems though when you look at the manuscript books of the 30s, right, they already know this information. Yeah. yeah. So that they don't need a distilled form. They're completely capable of obviously learning right. and absorbing and taking it. And yet I'm just wondering about the sort of gender mechanism yeah. at play, because I completely think you're right. It's an excellent point. Yeah. Kind of pull that out. So it's a ver what I'm going to say is a version of what I was saying to Sabrina. So that you do have a, you text after text, it's such and such for the ladies, such and such for the ladies. It is addressed to this imagined, yeah. ignorant woman. But and you know, Alfred Bain says, or is it Alfred Bain or is it Eliza Haywood? Um, I think they both say, this is for women. And men of leisure, it's for, it's for everyone. But it gets addressed as for the ladies. And then if you look at the readership of these texts, and um, which is a whole other world, but the, the readership of it shows that these are being sold to gentlemen like Samuel Pepys. To the, so, you know, Newton for the ladies is, it is not just for women. You know, Newton, I mean, it's impossible to understand, right? So uh, that just become, in a sense, if you want to say it's like a, it's a kind of marketing technique, 
that actually alludes to a much broader audience. And I would, uh, you know, Bill Warner makes this argument about the novel more generally, that the, you know, what we think of as, the, as amatory fiction and the domestic novel, that that is, um, that the, the kind of, the idea that that is just imagining and produced for a female, a kind of young impressionable female reader is historically very misleading and it misses the kind of pleasure of a reader entering into that space. And that absorptive reading itself is about being kind of being seduced and um, subjected to the text. So, but I, you know, it's, and if you start looking at um, kind of diaries and things like that, these, this, these texts are being consumed by a much broader category than, um, than just quote unquote the lady, yeah. Yeah. Male superiority and female very inferiority. So, so there's no reason why men wouldn't wouldn't read that. Mm -hmm. So let me point to a key difference between Fontenelle and El Garadi to get at this. So El Garadi has he talks about I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this simple. I'm not gonna use any of the calculations. I was also, I mean, Newton is, like I say, no one right. read, New I mean, so he's already starting off with um, kind of making a claim that's ludicrous, as if he has kind of primary knowledge. But he says, I'm only going to take us to the temple door. And so in the portico, that's what Newton for the ladies is. Fontenelle is very different. Fontenelle says, I am writing for those who are experts as well as the gentlemen and women who are not experts. So this... This, um, this trope, if you will, can be utilized in a variety of different ways. Someone like, and I think it's really important that someone like Elizabeth Carter is doing the translation of El Garadi. She is the one who brings Newton home. Mm -hmm. She was known, you know, uh, Samuel Johnson said she was smarter than, the smartest person he'd ever met, okay? She had a reputation for learning. And this was a kind of, Weirdly, the move, the you know Newton going through Al Garadi and then coming back through Carter was how Newton came to be known mid-century on, and um, and it is through this incredibly, incredibly brilliant learned woman. So it yeah, I mean it's there's not a clear cut, and that's why I think it's important we have to keep this, uh, all of this in mind. It is not that um, anything written to the ladies imagines when you know um, it's just. Yeah, kind of offensively imagining women as stupid, or as um, kind of idealistically imagining women as all-knowing, right, um, or or intelligent. But the the power of these, I think, is really important to keep in mind, and how it becomes. A, anyway, so. Yeah. Know, in the sense of group experience. And the idea, too, of seduction is a tool. I'm just kind of thinking of <clears throat> what all of the audience and you have been brought out in this discussion, so it's kind of commentary. But we, when we see the effects, not in romances, but in novels, of the attention to detail, yeah. because of the microscope and the um, unbelievability of uncovering what isn't seen and making that, um, that's different. Yeah. That is actually um, not metaphorical. It, 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 it's a tool for details of trade, mm -hmm. where you're talking about seduction as a technology for movement, you know, rather yeah. than one is a kind of active, though it could be have a passive recipient too, right. you know, in right. terms of seduction. So, I mean, it just these kind of confluences of all these ideas at the time. Yeah, yeah. And just the way seduction can be taken in different ways, so could experimental. Yeah. And whose learning and whose authority and whose view could be, you know, seen. Which you think, too, I mean, we're talking about seduction and what is believable and what you use in yourself. Um, and then you have something that's certainly not romance, but for some reason I started thinking of Defoe's 
absorption of Mrs. Neal <laughs> that is, you know, the observation that he's playing with this, but of course you think of this as a ghost story, or is it, did she come right. back, and right. what you can't attest to. So it just seems, it, and that's totally a different discourse that's going on alongside this yeah. transformation from seduction. Yeah. But it's playing with the sa some of the same ideas minus the seduction. So I guess I'm asking a way what the seduction is. It. Um, <clears throat> I'm not asking what yeah. the seduction is. You were saying supplying what the seduction mm -hmm. yeah. of that um, you know, co contributes. So one of the things that I think it is also key to the, the way that um, literary knowledge and science mm -hmm. operate is that alongside this pedagogical model, mm -hmm. which is based on pleasure, mm -hmm. um, there are gestures and there are um, uh, celebrations of a version of what you're talking about, detailed observation. Mm -hmm. um, detailed observation is at the core mm -hmm. of experimental knowledge production. And someone like Haywood, to go back to the female mm -hmm. spectator, mm -hmm. she is making an argument there, particularly around the uses of the microscope and uses of scientific mm -hmm. te technology, that this is a very good practice specifically for women. Mm -hmm. And specifically, you know, the, the main voice of the female spectator is a reformed coquette. And so Coquette is a kind of, you know, highly sexualized figure. Mm -hmm. She's an epistemological, she's a social and ideological problem because mm -hmm. she refuses to agree to get married to anyone. Mm -hmm. She's holding the moment of courtship at abeyance. But she's also a problem of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You can't know what her heart is, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So you can't know her. She's an epistemological problem. So Haywood takes that figure um, and... Um, reforms her. That's her, that's the female spectator, is a reformed mm -hmm. coquette. Mm -hmm. And part of what the use of uh, the practice, the praxis, the artisanal experience of, knowledge, of, of science can do is to help self-improvement. Mm -hmm. And a coquette, a reformed coquette is really good at science mm -hmm. because she knows how to look closely and carefully. All that experience looking at clothing, all that experience <laughs> analyzing society, all that experience kind of that close examination. So she's an unlikely but a very per, uh, pervasive exemplar of a kind of enlightened scientific subjectivity that becomes available from this. And one of the things that I really want to do to bring to this table, to the table, is through this kind of capacious archive that I'm describing to you, is to think much more broadly about uh, scientific subjectivity. And it's the ways in which women have access to it in different ways and men have access to it in different ways and different ranks and so forth. So the reformed coquette, I think, is just a remarkable moment uh -huh. for her. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, what science uh, for some people is very interesting and enlightening. Yeah. <laughs> And can I say thank you all is really nice. Thank you. Thanks very much.